Okay. So this morning I am talking to Oliver Preston. Lots of you will have had pleasure of enjoying his wonderfully amusing cartoons that reside in many downstairs loos and bedside tables across the country. <laughs> um, hi Ollie, thank you very much hi, for talking to us today. Um, so Ollie, it's 25 years this October since you became a cartoonist. Is there any particular publication that you got your cartoons published in that was the real yes moment? Right. Um, yeah, probably. Um, I started in 1995 and I actually did a business plan. <laughs> and I think in my business plan, which most cartoonists don't do, I have to say. Yeah. Um, and in my business plan, I wanted to draw for the Times, the Spectator, and Pri uh, and Punch magazine, which was still going in those days. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, in the first year, and I did all three, which was seriously good. Cool. Um, and I drew uh, a Spectator nightmare. You send in. 10 cartoons a week and you know you only get paid a hundred quid or something and then um you normally just get a little note back from michael heath saying sorry sorry you know whatever and eventually yeah. i got one into the spectator which was good um and uh the and punch you did the same thing you know sorry no not good enough you know whatever and i got one whole page cartoon in punch which i was dead chuffed about and then and then it folded oh, no. <laughs> so that was, that was really, you know, sort of not very good news. Um, and then I did actually get, I was always trying to get into the Times, you know, and they all had their own cartoonists. And um, I think the guy who was doing the, the pocket cartoon on the city pages went on holiday and I covered for him and drew it for two weeks. And I was living in Henley and the internet had just started um, and emails. And so I, I scanned it and made it into a JPEG and sent it through to the Times. And um, they had these huge screens um, on the ele electronic picture desk with all the sports cartoons coming through and the news pages and everything, and probably Tony Blair and everything else. And, um, and there was my tiny little pocket cartoon JPEG on it. And the journalist um, ran me up and said, um, we don't want, a, what is a JPEG? We don't want a JPEG. So he sent a bike from Wapping to Henley. Wow. The original. So they spent 250 quid on the bike and they only paid me 50 quid. Oh, God. <laughs> so anyway, I did that. But, but that was very exciting. Um, just, you know, as a cartoonist, to see your, you know, your drawing in print is cool. Um, sure. I tried to draw for Country Life back in 1995 and they turned me down. And I went to the Field magazine and started drawing there for um, really for 25 years. And then, um, uh, oh, and the other thing also is I drew for the Beano and the Dandy for six months. Oh, brilliant. Um, I developed a character called Marvin Marmite, um, <laughs> the Marmite. Yeah. And he had a cat called Damage and a friend called Tommy Toaster. And, Fantastic. and basically it, that was published a whole page. And that really was cool because that was like, you know, I'd read the Beano and the Dandy when I was little. So that was quite fun to, to see. And I then that um, was hugely satisfying. We had a, we had a, a huge row about copyright and then I retained the copyright I think they wanted to buy the copyright off me for a pound and I said no mm. um, and then um, we uh, then and then they brought out a new campaign called Marmite you either love it or hate it and that was the death knell of Marvin Marmite um, but actually oh, I did I, I started drawing for Country Life last October um, so that was a pretty exciting it's nice to do something that's a weekly because it gives you more profile absolutely yeah um, oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Um, so where do you get your ideas? Is it observing people, um, hearing stories? Do you sort of drop um, down ideas? Um, you kind of get them from everywhere. Um, yeah. You know, I do observe, I do watch, you know, I look at people like you and see what you do. Oh, God. Um, and, uh, you know, you just see things or you... You, you, you hear things. I mean, the other thing is, I mean, I obviously listen to the radio, I listen to, you know, television, I watch television and things, and you do hear things which give you ideas. 
Um, yeah. Quite often a, a good caption is, is um, just a, a, a general saying, which you can twist around or slightly alter. Um, you know, I've just done one for Country Life about a woman hitting the delete button on her, on her laptop. You know, it's a sort of, you know, why do you say I just hit the delete button? Yeah. But that's what people say. And it then becomes a caption for a cartoon. Yeah. Or um, I heard somebody, you know, people, uh, you know, please don't talk whilst I'm interrupting, you know, is a nice sort of phrase or something. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes you end up with a cartoon and you've got a very good drawing um, and you've got an idea. I did one about some dogs climbing up onto a four poster bed um, and just couldn't get the caption for it. And, and yeah. a, 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 a healthy bottle of wine and probably a bit more with my wife on a terrace yes. in Switzerland. And we came up with, hey guys, they've changed the sheets. <laughs> um, you know, so it, 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 it is totally oh. bizarre. And, and it is very, very important because when you have a cartoon, you, you literally have people's attention for two or three seconds. They look at it, they look at the picture, they look at the caption yeah. and the two together. And quite often you could hide the picture mm. or hide the caption and it will mean absolutely nothing. But when you marry the two together, it gives you the, the impact. Yeah. So, so when you do do captions for cartoons, I shorten them again and again and again. So they're not too wordy. Yeah. So, um, cause actually that my next question was, do you start oh. with the caption, then draw it or the other way around? I suppose either can happen, can it? Um, so yes. So I do start with the caption usually, um, and then draw the picture, which I have in my mind and I go straight in. I don't do yeah. rough sketches or anything like that. Um, and, um, you then draw the picture and at the end of it, you sort of go, actually, this caption might be better. <laughs> yes. So you change the caption and then you rub it out and you change it again and again and again. And then you always end up going back to the original caption, mm. which is the right one. Yeah. So, and, and it's drawing pictures without a caption or captions without a picture is, 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 is bad practice because in general, you end up with a pic. I've got quite a few pictures in the drawer that don't have captions. And I still can't work out what the caption is mm -hmm. for the cartoon. And they're great yes, pictures. Some just still they just mean things. nothing. Mm. <laughs> How annoying. Yes, very annoying. Um, and, and do you um, pencil them first, then, you know, the ink colour them or...? Yeah, I what, start what off with a... I draw on an A3 piece of very nice drawing paper that I've used. God, I'm so loyal. I've used the same paper. Mm. for 25 years. And I don't wow. like any other paper. I use the same inks. I use these oh, yes, little, little Windsor and oh, Newton wow. yeah. and gouache things like this. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I get very, up if I don't have the right ones, I get very upset. I have to go to the same shop in Sirencester to buy them. Where's and that? Just, uh, um, the Cone Gallery. The Cone ga Gallery, yeah. yeah. Very nice, actually. Um, and they're lovely in there. And they always have my inks. And I go in there and I sort of have a sort of splurge of spending and buy out every single link that they've got. And yeah. They wag their tails and they're thrilled that I've come in and then I come back in about four months time and do it again. Um, and, and I even have a second set of inks out in Switzerland as well, which I have to use. Yeah. So I draw with pencils. I draw with a 2B pencil. Um, yeah. And I will draw and I go straight in on a piece of paper in pencil and then I ink it in. I used to ink it in with black Indian ink. And now I use, um, I use something called nut brown now because it's a slightly softer um, colour. Yes. And I quite often use that for the background and then I might use a very strong black Indian ink in the foreground to make it stronger. Yeah. It's very interesting. I read something, a Bateman book about how to draw. And, you know, if you use a nib pen, which is what I use, one of these things. <laughs> yes. Or a Gillot nib. And, and, and the, 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 the pen, basically, it, it, you can widen it or, or, or make it thinner as you use it to put pressure on the page. But if you're drawing the top of a bald head like mine, <laughs> it's very, very thin. And under your chin, you do it very, very thick. So you get the different strength of line, yes. which, will, which will make the drawing proper, as it were. Yeah. So I will then draw it in, in, with, with black Indian ink, and then I colour it with inks and gouache. And at the end of it, I look at it and it is remarkable that you've had a piece of paper and you've done something on that piece of paper which has just come from nowhere. Yeah, amazing. Um, and sometimes it's quite good to go away and come back at it and you see it the next day and you can add some more shading or some colouring or something. It depends what sort of picture it is. 
Yes. Particularly caricatures. If I, I'm doing a big caricature of 20 people or 30 people, which I do quite a lot of, um, you know, getting the likenesses right. You work at it. And, you know, you've been drawing on an A2 piece of paper, a big caricature, you know, by the end of the day, you're quite tired. It's quite good to leave it and come back at it. And you'll suddenly look at it and go, that doesn't look anything like that person. I need to alter them. Yeah, sometimes you need um, a pair of fresh eyes, don't you? Yes, you do. After a night's, yeah. night's sleep. Yeah. Um, and do you think you need to be a great observer to be a cartoonist? I think it helps. Um, I think people always say, you know, Matt and the Telegraph is brilliant or so-and-so is brilliant. And I think actually... They are good. You know, Matt's a great friend of mine. And, um, you know, he is the most highly paid cartoonist in the country. He is extremely good. It's the first thing that everyone looks at every day. Mm. But he has got something <laughs> to draw about. Yes. So, you know, he's drawing about children going back to school or COVID or whatever it is. And, you know, he goes to the morning meeting at the Telegraph and they have all their um, ideas and then people pop into his office and say you could draw this or you could draw that. The, I think the people who are really really good cartoonists are the ones who draw for the spectator or punch as it was or private eye who basically just do jokes yeah and you know people like Tony Husband or or Ed McLachlan or um, Singleton there's all sorts of them Nick Newman are really brilliant because they just come up with jokes with gags mm -hmm. and and you know they are very very funny yes um, yeah you know, I mean, Nick Newman wrote all the um, uh, the script for Spitting Image with Ian Hislop before he became a cartoonist. Okay. You know, many cartoonists are quite often sort of, I mean, we were talking earlier, and they might be slightly depressive, but, you know, they are almost, I mean, a lot of them write for comedians, for, for um, you know, the, the Ronnie Barker or yes. whoever it was. You yeah. know, they, they are writers as much as, you know, and Matt is, is more of a journalist. His father's Oliver Pritchett. Uh, his grandfather was V.S. Pritchett, writers, mm. um, and his drawings are fairly simple. Whereas, you know, someone like Peter Brooks in The Times, it, it's a balance of really good drawings. I, I, for me, I think, you know, yes, I do observe a lot. You know, you need the observation to come up with the ideas. Um, yeah. But I think a good cartoonist is 50% drawing and 50% joke. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and uh, where did you learn to draw? <laughs> well, how did you learn to draw? Uh, I learned to draw. You just naturally. I learned. To, I'm embarrassed to say. I'm really embarrassed to say. I, it is a gift that I was given. Um, I I won lots of art prizes at my prep school, and when I was um, at big school, I um, won lots of art prizes. I did screen yeah. printing and things like that. Uh, I was always drawing cartoons of the teachers at the back of the class and handing them around. But they love uh, that. <laughs> I got in real trouble when I left. I was, I'd just done Oxbridge, which I didn't get into. And I drew cartoons of my housemaster in rather rude, um, oh, compromising positions with his wife. Oh, no. at, the, at the back of the prefect's door. And I was actually house captain. Yeah. And I was called back in the holidays. Oh, no. I drew it in one of those really thick marker pens, which you can't get rid of. Can't get off. And he rang my parents, absolutely livid, and pulled me back. And I had to go back to school and paint over the door. Because he was showing oh parents. Oh, my God. Around. How he was funny. parents around and shut the door. And he said, this is where all the senior boys in the house, the most responsible boys or whatever, went to the room, shut the door behind him. And there was pictures of him with his wife all over the back door. Over oh, the door. my God, how awful. He That's was so funny. so angry. And I had to paint it. I had to give it about four coats of paint to get rid of it. Yes, I'm it sure. strong stuff. Yeah. So there's an original Oliver Preston still behind that, that, that door. That's brilliant. It would be worth a um, fortune, that door. I don't He's think auctioning so. off. <laughs> I don't think so. Early Preston. Um, uh, so what was it? Oh, so, um, so the drawing, so my, um, bizarrely, my Swiss grandfather was a very good painter and my uncle is quite a well-known, Swiss uncle is quite a well-known architect. Dad drew a bit. My sisters both worked at Colfax and Fowler in London. So we have art in the family. Um, yeah. I, uh, well, you know, a big joke, you know, that Luckily, the art came from the Swiss side and not the humour. Otherwise, my career would be completely different. <laughs> um, and, and I just always did. I never went to art school. My housemaster no. said I should have gone to Kingston Art School, and I didn't. Um, no. Always drew, copied Bateman, Heath Robinson, Thelwell, Asterix, anything I could lay my hands on, I copied. 
Yeah. And then gradually you get your own style. I think probably quite good because if you've gone to art school, you sort of slightly get tuned into becoming a figurative artist or a mm. you know photographer. Or what, you know they they sort of bash it out of you. Whereas with me, you slightly get see what you get what you see what you get whatever. Yes. What yeah, you, yeah. What, it, it is what it is. You yes. Know? And I think as a result, I possibly people do say that I've, I have a style that they recognise, you know, yeah. which is really nice. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and um, uh, who are your, have you got any cartoon heroes? I have lots of cartoon heroes. Um, yeah. So, I don't know where to start. So I, I collect cartoons. Um, yeah. And... Um, I'm just looking behind you at a massive Heath Robinson on the wall. I mean, I just love the way he draws, the way he does his washes. Uh, they're beautiful pictures, Bateman, um, all of those famous 1930s, 40s cartoonists like Pont, yes. Ronald Pearl. Um, I, I, I went through a phase of buying Gilray. So Gilray is like the father of grandfather of political cartooning. He drew from about 1780 to about 1850. He went mad, got his head stuck between the, in the railings of the windows outside on St. James's. Oh, God. Uh, I, I think partially the printing process and all the paints made them go slightly weird. Oh, but he, he went to the Royal Academy with Rowlandson and was called by Goya, the finest artist in Europe, um, and decided to become a political caricaturist rather than an artist. Mm. Um, Asterix, Thelwell, political cartoonists, you know, yeah. all sorts of cartoons, love it. Yeah. Um, especially if they make me laugh. Yes, exactly. Well, as long as they make you laugh. Yeah. Um, and so just tell me about your, your chairman of the Cartoon Museum in yeah. London. Um, it's a wonderful idea. How, how did it all come about? Can you tell us about it? Um, I was asked to join as a trustee back in 19... 92 and still am um, and um, basically I think about a bunch of guys Heath Robinson's son and Bateman's daughter and Nick Garland, Mel Carman, various cartoonists got together and they, 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 they basically said you know we are really good at this art form this genre and there is nothing to show it all off right. I mean we are we have probably got the best heritage and history of cartooning going back to Hogarth um, Bateman Hill, you know, uh, Rowlandson, Gilray, Golden Age of Caricature, all the punchiers, and, and, you know, now we lead the world in graphic novels. So, you know, when you see a film like Kingsman yes. or Reap of Vendetta, you know, these are based on graphic novels drawn by English comic artists mm -hmm. or Viz magazine. You know, you, you forget, you know, Grand Theft Auto and and, and some of these games, you know, the massive gaming industry up in Dundee, all, you know, because these guys read Viz magazine or they read the Pino or they read yes. you know, 2000 AD. Yeah. And so, you know, it's a tremendous history. And uh, we, Kenneth Baker's my vice chairman, and we raised some money back in 2006 and took a punt. Viv and I drove around Little Russell Street and by the British Museum and we found a building and we took a lease on it and we opened our doors in 2006 and we've had... 420,000 visitors since we opened. Amazing. Um, the collection's grown from about 1,000 cartoons to about 6,000. We've got a library of 18,000 books. And uh, last year we raised um, a million quid to move us to a new building just off Oxford Street, which opened in July 2019, um, which is really cool with a 25-year lease. And that's yeah. where we're based. And, you know, we're not huge, Amazing. but we are, you know... I think we're very much loved as a museum and it's got an amazing museum shop. And, you know, if you want to go somewhere and spend a couple of hours after a good lunch and have a really good laugh, it's wonderful. Or see some amazing artwork. It's wonderful. Uh, uh, do, you, do you think um, it, it's somewhere a, a great place for children to see oh, as well yeah, yeah, as yeah. adults? I yeah, mean, definitely. So we have, we've, we've had 50,000 children through our doors. Yeah and we do children's classes, we teach them, they come in, so schools come in all the time uh, to come and visit the museum, they, they come and see. We did actually do a programme sponsored by Deutsche Bank where they tied it in with the national curriculum. So if you're studying the Second World War, you need to come and see the cartoons by David Lowe yes. about the Second World War. If you're studying Napoleon, you come and see the Gilrays. 
which make will, it a will, whole lot more interesting as well. well it, yeah, they can relate to it a bit more. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, half of them come Definitely. in and sit there looking at their phones and sort of not looking at the pictures on the wall, but oh, you know. No. Um, so yes, definitely, definitely children. Yeah, yeah. And um, presumably with lockdown the past six months, um, it's obviously been pretty tough. It's not been good. So we, we, we basically reopened in July 19 and in January and February our admissions were up 116 and 136%. Wow. We did almost all our budget in January and February for the whole of the first quarter. And then on the then. 18th of March, it just fell off a cliff. And and not only that, as a charity, you know, you're, you, you know, you're advised. You should, you should, you will, you will know this. You know, you're advised that you need to have three or six months, you know, reserves to enable you to carry on. Yeah. And we were looking at the figures and things, and basically, as things stood back in April, I mean, the museum was going to run out of money paying its staff and bills and things like in October. Oh. So we had a major, major problem, and. Um, uh, fortunately, um, a couple of people helped us at the beginning. We, we had a nightmare with the Arts Council and the Charities Aid Foundation rejected our applications. And I managed to get Libby Purvis to write an article about the Carlton Museum being in trouble in the Times. And then I set up a Virgin Giving page and it just took off and we raised £300,000 since wow. May. And so now, which is, I mean, you know, huge thing and then the government's got this very right you know and they 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 they, they you know the furlough the furlough scheme first of all you know we were in trouble as obviously were hospitality and airlines and mm. many many other businesses around the uk but the furlough scheme basically gave us the latitude to look after our six staff so a curator a, a, a director um, a museum shop manager and learning officers and things like that and and basically um that helped us with them but there was still going to be the problem of october when it stopped um and then the the the, we, the heritage lottery application the times article helped a lot and we got some we got hundred thousand off the lottery and then uh, the, the Virgin Giving site, we, we've raised £120,000 from 400 different people, really Fantastic. humble, who've given money, and Garfield West and the various other people. So, you know, really lucky, hard work, but yeah. we, can see our, we can see ourselves through now to the end of 2021. Brilliant. But okay. we are expecting, we're expecting, you know, the visitor numbers to be down 80%. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, no school visits. I mean, the schools basically are going to be keeping children in schools to make them catch up. Going with their yeah. And, you know, they don't want people, they don't want us to come into schools to teach them, and they're not no. going to want to bring their children to museums. No. no. But so you're think, open, though. It is we're opening. Open. On the, we're opening on the 17th of September. Okay. So, so please tell all your grapevine listeners. To yeah. I, well, I to, and actually, I, I was just saying to my sister um, yesterday. You know, it's quite a good time of year, quite good at the moment, to go to London while it is quiet. You know, you Brilliant don't want time. to. Be, you know, but but actually, you could go to museums, which are all basically pretty much empty, and have a nice yeah. lunch and just go out for the day. Now, I'm going to plan to do that. I think yeah. once the children are back at school, good. Definitely like to have a look. Um, so, Ollie, you set up. Um, the Cartoon Art Trust Awards yeah. in 1995 and you're involved with the Young Cartoonist of the Year competition. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us about the variety of uh, entries you have for this? Well, um, yeah. yeah. So um, the Cartoon Art Trust Awards are presented at a very jolly dinner and everyone gets very drunk. And, yeah. we usually have, and it's also a fundraiser for the museum. And, you know, we have a Lifetime Achievement Cup and Ronald Searle and Scarf and Stedman and all these sort of people. And we usually get some people like Andrew Marr or Harry Enfield or um, Joe Brand come and present. So it's really funny. Yeah. Um, and, and the idea behind that was, uh, you know, cartooning is a pretty lonely profession. You know, and as I said, if you, if you send cartoons to the spectator or private eye and you don't get many published, and, but you're good, you know, it's quite nice to recognise them and put something back into the industry. And they, the guys really appreciated it, you know, yeah. and still do. Um, the Young Cartoonist of the Year competition um, was actually set up in memory of Mel Carmen, who drew for the Times. And um, again, you know, I mean, Martin Rosen, who's the chairman of the British Cartoonist, always says that, you know, he wants to, 
identify the, poten the potentially really good cartoonists of the future so we can break their fingers to stop them challenging us and taking our jobs. Yeah. Um, but that aside, um, we get 2,000 entries um, and from all over England and um, from all sorts of places. And uh, you know, we had, you know, they come from Scotland or from Wales, North Wales or Anglesey or whatever. It's like we get free adverts in the newspapers. We did have one entry last year, which was from the guy that killed Lee Rigby. Um, and he's in Broadmoor and it was covered in stamps and things like that. Oh my God. And, um, you know, we sort of kind of didn't really, I'm slightly weird cartoon, but we, we sort of, you know, we judged it. So yeah. the judges are basically Matt, me, Peter Brooks from The Times, Martin Rosen from The Guardian, Steve Bell, Nick Newman from Private Eye. You know, and, and you get the most charming cartoons of, you know, drawn by 10 year olds, which are sometimes even funnier than ones drawn by 30 year olds. Yes. No, uh, we I'm have sure. under 18 and under 30 categories. So we're about to start doing that. That's coming up. We get free adverts from the newspapers. It's about, you know, which is very kind of them to help us. And that means we get entries. So if the Daily Mail puts an advert and you get lots of Daily Mail, mail reader type yeah. jokes. Yes, yes, <laughs> uh, sure. And, uh, and obviously if you get put it in the Daily Mirror, you get Daily Mirror type jokes. Yeah, so, yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to do. Um, yeah. And, you know, Will McPhail is a professional cartoonist who won it. There's a guy called Nick Edwards who won it in 2009. Yeah. He won an Emmy in the States for his uncle grandpa cartoon uh, strip. Wow. So it does it does does do good. Yeah. Fantastic. Um and Ollie, what advice would you give somebody who wanted to become a cartoonist? Uh it's difficult. Um it, I always think it's slightly like being an actor. You know, you the people at the bottom are paid absolutely nothing and the people at the top are paid millions and millions. Mm. Um and um you know, there are courses. There's a course at Stafford University. Um, and we do cartooning classes and things like that. Um, animation, cartooning, um, anime, manga. Um, you've just got to keep persevere. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm always very helpful, try to help people, you know, if they want to ask. I think most of us will. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, drawing for the big newspapers is dead man's shoes. Mm. Um, if once you're in there, I mean, Peter Brooks is you know, 78. Um, yes, yeah. Max just retired from the Daily Mail, aged, you know, 80. Yeah. Um, and um, there are, uh, you know, if you draw, if you want to draw for the private eye, you know, mm. there's 20, 30 cartoon slots and they get about a thousand sent to them a week. Gosh. So the competition Gosh. is tough. tough. Yeah. Um, you know, I started out by drawing for PR companies and then drawing cartoons for the city. I started doing caricatures. You know, I look back on some of the things I did previously going, ah, those are awful. Um, but, you know, that's, that's how you start. Um, and obviously what you really need is to find something that pays you regular money. So yeah. if you end up drawing for the, for the, you know, Colchester Gazette and they yeah. pay you anything, you take it. Yeah, yeah got to start somewhere haven't you yeah um so you used to work in the city um at uh, layman brothers selling layman brothers. yes i did sorry <laughs> um was it a big risk um and a huge leap of faith to uh, become a full-time cartoonist and um, my dad my dad wasn't very impressed no Sure. Leaving Lee oh. to become a cartoonist wasn't quite the career choice that he thought had in mind for me. Um, uh, do you know, I, I mean, I think when I left university, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I was always drawing. Uh, most of my friends went to work in the city. I did. And I, I think with hindsight, you know, when you start out, you know, you, 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 I think the most important thing when anybody starts out age 21, 22, 23, is to just get a job and get the experience of going to work, getting out of bed in the morning and getting yeah. a salary, seeing your friends. You know, if I'd become a cartoonist at the age of 22, I mean, I probably wouldn't be one now because I wouldn't have made any money. Um, okay. And I always, I'm really glad that I worked in the city because I know what a guilt is. I know what money supply is. I know what they're talking about on 
the economics programs on the news. Mm -hmm. And I made quite a lot of money, which I then mm -hmm. spent, yeah. uh, supporting myself as a cartoonist. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I, I worked in a dealing room, which was amazing. I loved working at Lean Brothers, really loved it. It was a great place to work. You know, it lost its way 10 years later. Um, but when I worked there, it was a fantastic place to work. Huge sums of money being, you know, traded and yeah. very nice clients. And of course I learned how to sell and I learned how to market. I learned how, so all of those things that I learned at Lehman's, um, you know, I put to good use when I became a cartoonist. And actually yeah. I've drawn cartoons for city banks for 20 years. Yeah. So, and you know, and that's been quite good bread and butter. Oh, uh, for sure me. it has. That's really good. Um, and Ollie, you did an amazing commission, which mm, <laughs> might be able to see in the background. Life yes, not very good. Uh, for uh, my mother to give my brother yeah. um, of uh, African Safari Lodge and all the funny things that. Uh, I don't think you should actually show it to anyone. Went, <laughs> went on <laughs> there. Other things in there are probably either illegal or completely rude. I know, <laughs> I think they are. Um, but do you do a lot of commissions? Um, uh, I do. A lot, I do a lot of commissions. What, I do a lot of commissions. What's the process to have... get the detail? <coughs> so I, I suppose, you know, you have different parts of your business, as it were, which is, you know, I draw weekly for Country Life, so I have to do a lot of those. Yeah. Then I would. Uh, we run a publishing company, so I do books, etc., and we do greeting cards, which brings in money. Um, and then um, I do quite a lot of commissions for people, um, and they can be literally anything from Christmas cards to um, big deal celebrations for Merrill Lynch or Goldman Sachs or whatever, or um, caricatures because it's somebody's mother's 80th birthday and yeah. the family wants to get together and give her something nice. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I do them from photographs, uh, you know, quite often, particularly people in the city send photographs, you know, when they're 55 years old and they're fat and bald and wear glasses and they send mm. pictures of themselves looking 22 in Barbados with a suntan, you know, I mean, you can only draw as good as the photograph you get. You get, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and, um, you know, and it's, it's very special to, to that person or that family or to that bank or to the people who've got it um, because it's a record of their life, you know, and if, you, if they've had a dog that's died, you can put the dog in even though it's dead. Yeah, yeah. You know, or, or, or the house in the background or, you know, somebody had racehorses and I drew their entire flower bed um, full of... Uh, the, the 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 and all the horses are named after flowers so all right, the flowers okay. represented the different oh, race really? horses they owned um and so you never know what you're doing when and i'm quite good at extracting out of people what uh you know what they might put into it sort of thing um yes. and um and, 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 and as ever you know if the people are characters it makes it a lot more fun Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, and what would you say if you got a sort of one that was perhaps the most extraordinary, um, fun, I don't know, unusual commission uh, that you've been asked, you've been asked to do? Um, well, actually, I was, just, I was asked to draw one for a, a big event in Ireland um, in, in March of 100 people. Right. Which was going to be two metres across by one meter high wow um and it was for a big sporting event in ireland and that bit the dust with covid19 what a shame uh, but it was going to take place in june um I, i've done one for somebody in in uh, in the states in deer valley um who was i think he was an ibm air or something mm -hmm. but he was building this massive great chalet and they had a lift that went from the basement up to the top floor where it was ski in ski out Wow. And I did a five foot by four foot picture of the chalet with all the children and all the people in it um, doing what they do. So the, the son playing his electric guitar downstairs in the studio and the, the mother doing a jigsaw puzzle out on the terrace. It was a bit yeah. like Where's Wally? Um, and there were about 70 people in that so with, with all of them in the picture two or three times doing different yes. things. And what's quite cool is that when the lift doors opened, the mm. picture was there. 
and then the lift doors closed. And of course, one of the slight problems I have with my pictures is that, um, you know, they don't like light. No. So they will fade, you know, yeah. if you hang them in front of direct sunlight uh, because of the inks and the, just the nature of it. So the picture being stuck in a lift the rest of its life perfect. is the perfect place for it. Yeah, how brilliant. <laughs> I know, exactly. Completely perfect. Um, um, you know, I don't know why. I mean, there's always, you know, as I said, you know, drawing cartoons for Marmite for the Beano or, yes. um, you know, um, all, all sorts of things. Um, oh, it must Mark be so Burley, much fun. Mark Burley bought a whole bunch of them, you know, 10 of them for, for Annabelle's and for George and for his house at home. Yes. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and it's, it's quite strange sometimes when you see them coming up at auction, um, you know, and, and some, sometimes I look at them going, you know, I, I, don't, I don't even, I, I, I do remember most of the pictures I've drawn, actually. I've got a rather yeah. attentive memory. Um, you must have drawn so many. Well, so I have got, I've got plan chess here. I mean, just full of blooming pictures. I bet. And I quite want to do the old, what, 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 um, uh, Alfred Munnings did. He burned half his pictures in the back garden. Oh no, can't um, do that. No, but sometimes you sort of they're looking again. I, I, I'm so embarrassed about that one. I think I might just that might just disappear. disappear. And never that again. <laughs> <Basically>. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, Ollie, you've got a publishing company, um, yeah. Beverston Press, mm -hmm. um, and you've done twenty books, and you, you yeah. do lots of greetings cards and things. Do you enjoy the drawings for these mm. as much as? Well, to be honest, most of the drawings for them come from things that I've either drawn for the field or for country life. Yeah. Um, it's like a technical hitch, which is that the field, drawings for the field are portrait, and the ones for country life are horizontal. Um, so yeah. we've had to slightly fine tune the greeting cards. Um, but um, so, I mean, I do, I mean, you know, then I get so much. So Beverston Press is run by my gorgeous wife, Vivian. Uh, who is well, multi-talented and uh, in her own right a very successful businessman before she married me um, and uh, she you know she might turn around and say we need to do some jigsaw puzzles or we need to do some notelets or yes clocks or whatever and then I have to sort of draw pictures for those yes but most of what we do is is basically paper so greeting cards notelets prints um, and people are incredibly kind and they buy them um, and they give them to people. I mean, they seem to be quite nice for presents for weddings and birthdays and obviously they post easily and they're the right sort of price point. Um, the books, well, I mean, actually the books, I did a book called Liquid, Liquid Limericks was my first book. Right. It's quite rude. Um, and, but it was all about wines. So um, a beautiful blonde called Eliza had a boyfriend who liked to despise her. Yeah. The bud name of Bud gave her diamonds all dud, so she ditched him, and that made Bud wiser. <laughs> <laughs> um, and things like that. And right. that sold, then that sold, there's another one. Uh, a Scots lass, one Mistress McCartan, led a life that was sober and spartan. Yeah. But she'd push out the boat once a week down her throat, went a magnum of Leoville Barton. <laughs> and they sold 10,000 copies of that, and, and, and okay. I got paid a thousand quid. I thought that's rubbish. Yeah. So we set up our own publishing company and we've published our own books ever since. Quite right. Quite um, right. And, uh, you know, so we will sell five, six thousand of a book, which is great. Um, yeah. and, and it's a niche market, um, but we love doing it. And I still go to Spirit of Christmas or the game for touting my stuff. Yeah. Dragging women onto the stand to try and persuade them to buy my books for presents. And I'm, and I'm sure you persuade them very easily <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, very good. Yeah. Um, and Ollie, uh, what do you do to relax outside of the studio when you're not working? What's your sort of um, well, your favourite pastime or place well, on holiday? You you are self-employed, presumably. Um, when you're self-employed, you don't really relax, actually. You sort of no. can't get to work all the time. So you never get away. So if I said to you, you know, my idea of heaven would actually be coming in here on a Saturday and Sunday when the telephone's not ringing, and I can get away from the world and just draw, mm. I mean, it's actually quite relaxing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I do, we have a farm here, so I do, um, I loved your J JC interview. Um, <laughs> and uh, everything that he was talking about, we completely relate to. You know, 
shall we plant vegetables? No, not a good idea. Shall we get sheep? No, yeah. not a good idea. There's always a downside. So we have 100 acres only, but we, we have oilseed rape and things like that. And that, but I do get on a tractor. It's all contract farm. But I get on a tractor and I top the fields, which I quite like. Um, I'm always mowing lawns, which I love doing because I'm completely asinine and useless, but it's quite fun. Quite um, therapeutic. Quite therapeutic. Satisfying. Yeah. I, quite like, I quite like sort of mending things. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I do. My so uh, I, I, if you, we have quite large farmyards, so we're, I'm always mending gutters and, and um, yes. spraying weeds and whatever. And then, we, and then we go back in and we sort of slump and light a fire and open a bottle of wine and watch a box set Perfect. or something. Perfect. Or, or I read magazines. And I get almost every magazine there is to read. And I read them from cover to cover, which I love doing. Yeah. And then obviously we spend a bit of time in Switzerland, so we ski. Yes. And I mean, it's always good. I think it's great for, um, you know, it's good for your marriage as well to, you know, have something like the Cartoon Museum where I go to London, get away. You know, if Viv doesn't want me. And it's quite hard working with your wife. You know, she runs a published company. We see each other every day. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, it's a special kind of relationship that keeps that going and you don't, you know, snap at each other. Yes. Um, so we, we, that seems to work okay. Yes, That's it's quite hard when... You're working together. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, she gets pretty bored of me saying, is this funny? You know, <laughs> is, this, is this cartoon funny? And she goes, saying, yes. No. And no. I go, why, is it, why isn't it funny? And she goes, well, it just isn't, you know. Yeah. And I then go, well, you obviously don't know what you're talking about. It, it, it obviously is funny. You know, <laughs> four and a half hours drawing it. Oh. Um, or, you know, in the middle of the night, you know, I suddenly, she suddenly hears a commotion in the oh. bedroom as, you know, I'm trying to find a piece of paper to write down an idea that I thought You've of. You've got to get, get it down on paper, haven't you? Yeah, and then I knock, and I knock over the bottle of water on the side yeah, of the table. Yeah. You know, and then, and she goes, what are you doing? You know, and if I don't write it down, I forget about it. And then yeah, breakfast, I, I had this brilliant idea last night. Yeah. And I didn't write it down. And I cannot Have remember to. what it was. Yeah. So I drive up the M4 motorway and I have to talk into my phone. Or I ring myself and leave myself answer phone messages. Yes. That's no, it's good. You have to, you have to act on it immediately, yeah, don't you? You do have to act on it. Um, you do lose it. it goes. The idea goes. Yeah, and I'm afraid as you get older, you know, me, 57, you know, you, you forget about them even quicker. Um, it's, uh, it only gets worse as we get older, I guess. Yeah. Um, I have all the pictures on your wall. It's very nice. Who's the best golfer? The best golfer? Um, is there a golfing one up there? It says hanging off the hanging off the candelabra. It says oh ben. God! Oh yeah, no, I think that that's a sort of joke. Uh, <laughs> nobody. I think one of the children must have given that to Ollie. Um, oh really? Uh, I mean, yes, he can play golf Maybe a lot better than me. Gopher. Does what? he say best gopher? Gopher. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, Ollie, you've uh, very kindly um, offered uh, members a chance to bid for one of your original cartoons. Yes. Um, and so we thought, uh, having discussed this earlier, we sort of agreed that perhaps we would do a silent auction yeah, um, uh, for this. And, and the amount raised would be split between... Um, the three charities that Grapevine, uh, that we support. Um, one of which yes, is which are. Homes. Sorry? Which are. Which, which are, are. <laughs> one of which is Open Homes for Children, yep. um, which is eradicating orphanages uh, around the world. Um, the other is the Charlie Waller Memorial Trust, uh, which is a uh, charity set up um, to help people with, depression um, and I suppose in short uh, preventing suicide mm. um, in young people um, and then the third one Great Western Air Ambulance which we think is a, a, a much needed um, charity um, yeah. we're all gonna need at some stage possibly well, hopefully well, I, I think it's a really good idea and I think it's a good idea for a couple of reasons one is uh, it's lovely speaking to Panda and Lovely speaking to you. Chatting too. away on a uh, Tuesday morning, which will, when it's post posted, will be another morning. Yes. But um, it's quite nice that 
we also give something back. You know, I've, I've, as I said, I've been a trustee of the Cartoon Museum for 30 years and chairman for 20. And this year particularly, you know, has been hell for charities. Yeah. And I think, you know, if your listeners were prepared to divvy up and send you an email with a motley bid for my picture. Oh, my picture, it's here. Yes, let's see the picture. It's here, it's here. So if I hold it there, there it's, we are. A, it's back to front, Just isn't it? Just go back a tiny bit. Go, yeah, perfect, perfect. Yeah, I can there see that back to front. Is it actually the right way around? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. there it is. It's so the right way around. So this is the original cartoon from the Field magazine from 2013. It's brilliant. If you don't like shooting, don't look now. If you do like shooting, you might want to bid for it. Yeah. It would look good in your downstairs loo. Um, and um, if you are willing to send an email and divvy it up, and I think that those three charities, you know, the Great Air Ambulance, Wiltshire Air Ambulance, you know, we will all need is fantastic. Um, yeah. As a cartoonist, um, there are cartoonists who have committed suicide and are, it's a lonely profession. So, and I, you know, all of us might know somebody who's, has been afflicted by a child committing suicide, um, which is simply awful. So I think that's fantastic. And obviously Homes for, um, Hope and Homes is also good. So if, if, if we could get some bids for it, and when are we gonna have the closing date? Well, um, I think what we will do is, the closing date will be on the Friday, the 18th of September. So yeah. there'll be five days to okay. do your, um, your bidding and uh, we will, the highest bidder <laughs> will be the um, proud owner of your fantastic shooting cartoon. Yeah, that's very kind, that's very kind Penny. And, 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 and guys if you, do, um, if you do bid for it please support it because it'd be nice to give something to charity. Fantastic, thank you, thank you Ollie and Ollie thank you so much for talking to me today. To you. Um, that was really fascinating to hear everything. It was really enjoyable. Thank and you very good much. luck with the museum and Thank I hope you. things pick okay. up quickly. Go and see it. I'm going. Absolutely <laughs> gonna go, definitely. Okay. Thanks, Ollie. Bye. Bye.